Welcome back to Let Them Eat Bread. I know it's been a while. Thank you for your patience. And wow, has there been a lot of news that's happened in the last two weeks. Obviously, uh, the thing that we're going to spend the most time talking about is Ukraine. But as always, there will be a special segment for those who stick around for the politics segment that won't be put into segments on YouTube later on. So stick around and figure out what that is. This week for our bread, we are making a buttermilk loaf. It's supposed to only make one loaf, but I've tried baking this before, and it actually comes out much better as it, it, it comes out so big as one loaf that today we're going to try it as two. So we're just going to we're going to move around some of the times for rising, especially on the back end. And with that said, let's get started. We are going to start with half a cup of water between 100 and 115 degrees, just putting that into our little mixing bowl here. Next up, we have a tablespoon of regular white sugar. This is the only sugar we put in. Next, we have two packages or one and a half tablespoons of active dry yeast. Now give that a little bit of a stir. We are going to set this aside once we th stir it nice and thoroughly. Um, you're not trying to dissolve necessarily, just get everything thoroughly mixed up. Then give that a cover and put that to the side. Next up, we are going to take our flour. We have four cups of unbleached hard wheat flour, or AP flour if you can't find it. And to that, we are going to add one tablespoon of salt. You know the game I play, I'm always guesstimating, but this is about a tablespoon of salt in here. Next up, we are going to add our melted butter. This is three tablespoons of melted butter. I recommend unsalted. And then finally, we are going to add our cup and a half of buttermilk. You can use full fat or low fat. It will not change this recipe significantly. So just pour in what you need and then we'll get to mixing. So our mixing is going to start out pretty slow. You can see that I have used a bowl that's probably a little too small here. If you're in a standing mixer, you just want it on the stir setting. Essentially, you're just putting this all together, and you can see that after a while, it comes together um, in this shaggy dough. At last, right before we turn it out on our board, we're going, to go, we're going to add our yeast mixture, which has been blooming, and then give it one final mix here. Again, slowly making sure that you don't get any of that yeast mixture on your board. Uh, that way you get as much moisture in this dough as possible. You're going to need it. All right, so you can see that after some mixing, it is a pretty hearty shaggy dough. and We're just going to dump that out on our board. Just making sure that you get all of the fun flour and other bits out of your bowl. You are going to have to add flour to this anyway, but the best thing you can do is just make sure you get all the ingredients out of the bowl in the first instance. All right, so now you can see that, uh, well, I've sped up the footage, but you start slow, you just kind of combine it. The dough will feel very wet. That's okay, add flour where needed. And as you can see, after a bit of kneading, it does come together. And as I mentioned, we're gonna add some flour. I did this four or five times. You can do it as many times as you need to, but don't do too much. That way, you remember, you want it to be tacky and not sticky, but you also don't want it to be too dry. This is a nice, lovely dough. And now that we've finished our kneading, about 10 minutes, we're just gonna make sure this is in a beautiful ball form before we take off our little piece to do the window pane test. And let's just speed that up because this is always the longest part. Okay, so, excuse the musical interlude, we have, uh, and we're good, we have enough. So we've put our piece of dough back on our bread, put it back into a ball before we prep it for rising. We're taking a teaspoon of olive oil and putting it in a glass bowl in which we will rise our bowl. And we are just carefully making sure that every nook and cranny of this glass bowl has oil on it, just enough so that our bread does not stick. We are not trying to add oil to this recipe. So just make sure your bread is in the right shape, put it in the bowl, give it a quick toss, make sure that you have oil on every side. Remember you are lubricating your bread so it doesn't dry out during the rising. And then we are going to throw some plastic wrap over that, use something more sustainable if you have it, but I don't. And once that is added, we are going to put a tea towel over and then set our timer. All right, so we have prepared our bread. It is now set to rise. We've set about an hour for a timer. You can do this for up to an hour and a half. Remember, as I said earlier, we're going to be pushing this bread kind of to the limits of its ability to rise. So the more time, the merrier. When we get back from the break, uh, from the politics segment, we're actually going to do our bread, have it rise in the tins for another hour and a half. So take a long time to rise this. Um, make sure it's more than doubled in bulk each time you finish with it. 
And then once you've done that, you know, you can move on to the next steps that we talk about. So no pressure. Take your time with this bread. The bread is very forgiving. It's got a ton of yeast in it. Um, and it's going to be really great broken out into two loaves. So moving to our politics portion now. As usual, if you are not here to stay with us, I will see you in about an hour. If you are here to stay with us, we're going to start with the segment uh, that is not getting brought into made into YouTube videos this week, and that is going to be talking about fishing. So I don't mean like going fishing, like, you know, casting a line in water and all that good stuff. I'm talking about the types of fishing where people who you don't know or people pretending to be people that you do know try and get information from you. And the way that they often do that, and I'm going to talk about the ways that they often do that, how you can avoid it, and just kind of general tricks the trade. So as you all know, I work in privacy. Uh, as I'm a privacy lawyer, I've mentioned this on the show a bunch of times. And so one of the things that is really important to us in the privacy world is to make sure people aren't clicking on things they're not supposed to or giving the information that they're not supposed to or that's important to them. So how do fishers fish you? So there's a number of ways that people receive uh, phishing attempts. Um, email is a really common one. You know, text messages and voicemail messages are new ways to do it. Some of these aren't necessarily phishes necessarily. Some of them just are kind of old fashioned scams, but they all kind of fall into the general phishing category, right? Because phishing and spear phishing is a way that people, nefarious actors, get a whole of information about you that they can either use against you or use for profit, right? So the difference, let me start with the difference between phishing and spear phishing. So phishing is just a general attempt to get at your information not you specifically, but it's a general attempt to get at information that you have. These attempts are often generalized. They will be sent to lots of different people. Essentially, you're casting as wide a net as possible, and you just want to see who takes the bait, right? That's regular fishing. And then spear fishing is, um, as it sounds, is a more exact approach. So oftentimes, if someone is trying to spear fish you, they want something particular from you whether it is your birth date or your social security number or a credit card number or something like that. And in order to pose as some, uh, in order to get your information, they either pose as someone you trust or pose as someone you know or po pose as an organization you trust. So a fish uh, uh, where, where a fish might read dear customer or you know dear concerned citizen or dear you know general phrase here, a spearfish will actually have your name in it. So, right, a, a one dressed to me would be like, Dear Ben, or Hello, Mr. Walsh, right? That would, that's a spearfish because they've done at least some minimal level of digging on me to know enough about me to have my name as part of the fish, right? So it's entirely possible that they're looking for a specific piece of information from me. So now that you know the difference between fishing and spearfishing, how does it work? So... In the last couple of years, and this is especially picked up during the coronavirus pandemic, you've maybe have gotten some text messages from numbers that look similar to yours or similar to your area code, but you don't recognize them and the contents don't really make sense. Well, these are really important to avoid because oftentimes this is a fish. So what happens is people who are looking for this information are actually able to essentially put in a phone number generator um, on both ends, on their end and your end, and they generate a number for the phone, for the fish to be from, and then they either randomly generate your number or select your number from a list of numbers that they have. And they try and get you to either pick up the phone or they try and get you to reply to their text message. And regardless of what it is, they're going to try and either pose as a human or a representative of some sort um, or a representative of some company. And they will play this game with you where they talk, start to talk about something that sounds urgent, right? The hallmarks of a fish or a phishing scam are that whatever it is that the person or persons or organization is asking for, it's always a matter of urgency, right? They, the reason that they use urgency is because oftentimes, as humans, when we're reacting to something that has an immediate nature about it, we don't think about it as much as we probably should, right? So if we feel that something's urgent, we may have a more emotional reaction to it as opposed to a rational reaction to it. And 
scammers try and take advantage of this to try and get you to give away pieces of information or to give them money or whatever it's gonna be. So as an illustrative example, uh, I remember years ago, I received a phone call that was from the IRS. Now, they didn't have my name. They they just addressed me as you for the most part, but they they talked about how, you know, I was going to owe all this money if I didn't call this number and resolve the issue, right? Now, and you know, I had a lot less money back then and my situation was very dangerous uh money-wise. So if you know, if there was, I was suddenly going to owe the government a lot of money, I was going to be in a lot of trouble. So it created an emotional reaction in me. And, you know, I, I thought very strongly that I actually had to respond and, and give them my information. But I was, I, I was able to think about it for a second, I was able to get off the phone, um, because it was it was recorded message, it wasn't a person on the other end. Um, and, you know, I, I called my parents and said, Hey, have you ever heard of this? And they said, No, it's a scam. Ignore it. But in that moment, right, I was very ready to give them my information to act on the urgency. So by, so that's why um, urgency is often used. Now in a phone call, it's it's often difficult to get you to give you that information. So a lot of times what happens instead is they tr the, the the scammers are trying to get you to click a link. So you've probably heard that you should not click links that you don't know where they go or don't trust them. That's definitely true. And especially if it's a text message or an email from an email address that you don't recognize or an, an email address that kind of looks similar. So the way that email addresses are done to kind of mirror the trick that they use with phone numbers, right? Where the, the area code's the same or the first six digits are the same as your number. So you think it's kind of similar is what they'll do is they'll create an email account that looks like an official email account, but has something about it that's missing in particular, right? So for example, you might receive um, an email from USPS, uh, from, an, from like no reply at USPS.com. Well, you might know that USPS, the United States po Postal Service, is actually a .gov domain. So that's the way they can trick you, right? If, if you're not paying attention, then it just looks like it's, and by the way, they guzzy these email accounts up and email emails up to actually look official, right? But if you don't know, you might click the link thinking it'll take you to a package that was being delivered to you that you missed, right? Or, or something like that. So you have to be really careful when you get these, these emails and get these links. Another thing is these links will often pose as links to trusted sites. So it might say, um, you know, the, the, so in the USPS.com example, maybe it says, you know, you have a package coming to you, you've missed it. If you don't respond within, you know, one business day, we are going to ship it back to the person who sent it to you or whatever, or something like that, or, or, or you'll be fined for not picking up the package or, or some message like that. And then it provides you a link. And the link will say something like USPS tracking number, yada, yada, yada. They'll just give you a bunch of random numbers. And it'll look really official. And the link will look legit. It'll have all the bits and pieces of it that you'd usually expect to have for a USPS link. But if you hover over the link, you can actually see that it doesn't go to the USPS website. It, it leads you to some website you've never heard of. But if you don't hover over it or don't right click and inspect it, what often happens is they expect you to rely on this official looking message sending an official link. So you just click the link without thinking about it, right? And then it takes you either to a site where it can download a virus onto your phone or computer, or they, you know, whatever the scam is, the, the money scam or whatever the information scam, they ask you to enter in the particular piece of information. Sometimes it's passwords too, and they get you to give that information. Then they use that information to either take money from you. They use that information to, um, create a profile that looks like you and scam other people, right? Because not it's not always the case that these fishers are looking to get information from you that will profit them immediately, right? Sometimes maybe you have a lot of people on your social networks that you're connected to. So perhaps the scam is to get you to click on a link so they can get access to your public profiles so that they can post as you and make people think that you are endorsing this thing. They then click on the link and on and on it goes, right? 
So that's also kind of a way that fishing happens. Honestly, the basics of not getting fished are don't click on anything that you don't recognize and have not inspected, regardless of whether it's on your phone or your computer. The second thing is if it looks like it's urgent, take a step back and make sure that you can actually verify the urgency of the thing and that the information is the urgency of the information is coming from a reputable source. Three, always check the source of the information that you're getting from a phished email. If it looks familiar, if it looks legit, but you notice little tiny things are off, trust your instincts. Oftentimes, those little things that you think are off are actually huge red flags. Also, pay attention to spelling and grammar. Oftentimes, these phishing messages are put together with very little effort because they are totally casting wide nets. They don't care whether you click or not necessarily because they have enough fishes out there, hooks out there, as it were, that they'll fish somebody, right? And that's always the plan. So oftentimes, you'll find things like grammar mistakes, punctuation mistakes, spelling mistakes, um, misidentification of gender, right? So if you're a mister, if you go by mister, perhaps they put miss or master or missus, right? And same thing for any of those, right? But if you take a second to look at all of these pieces of information, the, the urgency, the address, the links, all these things, you'll start to notice patterns where it becomes obvious that someone is trying to scam you for something that you don't already, uh, that you're not willing to give to them, right? They're trying to get information from you. Another thing you can do, and this is especially true over email, is if the email looks like it's from someone that you know, as in like another human being, just check with that human being to make sure that they have sent you the email in question. Um, there's this uh, nightmare story that's kind of traded in privacy circles where a person, in, it, they don't say the company that this happened in, but a person in HR got an email from the CEO demanding a list of every employee's name, personal information and pay grade at the company. And it had to be delivered immer uh, immediately. They needed it for some meeting or whatever. So the HR person compiles this list and sends it back to the CEO. Now, lots of issues there. But one of the biggest issues is, is that in this particular workspace, the individual in question, the, the, the actual CEO was only a few offices down. You guys, remember when we used to work in offices? Hilarious. Anyway, back was only a few offices down from the HR person. So they could have just walked down, knocked on the door and said, hey, did you actually send this email? You've never sent requests like this before. I just want to verify it with you. And by the way, if this HR person had done this, then they wouldn't have leaked a whole bunch of really sensitive information about the company out to whoever who was posing as the CEO, right? And by the way, in work environments, and one of the reasons that businesses are so careful about training people about this is because in the work environment, oftentimes it's very easy to um, pretend to be someone else because businesses typically use common nomenclatures like, you know, first initial last name at company name dot com, right, to illustrate someone. So if a scammer wants to pretend to be someone, they simply Google the company, they look up who the CEO is or who some of the directors are or whatever. They create a fake email account that looks very similar, but has like one or two letters missing or a letter spelled wrong. And then they start to ask random people in the organization. And maybe sometimes they look for a specific person in an organization, more like spear phishing, to get information from them, right? But reg regardless of the context, right? So if you're at work, ask the person who sent you the email if they meant it. If you're at home and you know this is coming from a friend or family member, ask them. But if it's coming from a company or you think it's coming from a corporation and it mentions things like a tracking number or an order number or a product that you bought recently, oftentimes there are ways to independently check these pieces of information against the official sources. So if you got something from Target saying, you know, click here to access your uh, new credit rewards or whatever. Sorry, I don't really shop a lot at Target. I don't know what they what their award system is, but whatever. Right. So they're they're system emails you 
but you don't recall having a Target Rewards card or you haven't shopped at Target for a while, you can actually go to Target's website and, and try entering the information from Target into Target's actual website. And then you'll figure out very quickly that, oh, this is a scam. Target didn't actually reach out to me, right? And you can do this for a lot of different sites because these uh, corporations that actually have your information, a lot of the times are trying to be careful with it because they know that you put your trust in them for these particular items in, you know, in their care. So these are just some ways that you can hopefully avoid being fished. And I wanted to cover this because first of all, it's my wheelhouse. It's something I deal with every day, but also, and more importantly, from uh, when the coronavirus pandemic started, a lot more of these scams started coming up. People started getting all these phone calls and text messages and emails from people or businesses that they trust that are asking for things to them, right? It's much harder to scam people. Um, so it, people thought it was much easier to scam people now uh, during the pandemic because everyone has defaulted to getting things delivered to home, right? So if you just make your scam look like something that people are already doing, they're much more likely to click on it. They're much more likely to give you the information or to sign into your fake web page, give them access to your accounts with your payment card information, et cetera. So hopefully you've learned a little bit from me about phishing. Hopefully you can avoid being fished or spear fished um, because truthfully, there isn't a lot of recourse for you once you get fished. Um, sure, if it's a credit card, you can cancel a credit card. If it's a bank account, you can work with your bank. But things like identity theft, which are often um, a common set of information that's taken during phishing attacks, it's very hard to change some of that stuff. And it's very difficult for the government to track down these people because either they're using VPNs or um, they're using a burner phone or they're using um, a phone number generator to create the communications. So there's very little paper trail, as it were, for getting these people caught. So Unfortunately, for a lot of this stuff, it just really comes down to what you as an individual can detect and can stop. Um, so to, to paraphrase Smokey the Bear here, only you can stop phishing attacks. So hopefully this little lesson in phishing and spear phishing has helped you be your own Smokey the Bear. Oh, that's good, that's good. All right, so we might as well do this. So the reason you're all here, <clears throat> kind of, the Ukraine story, right? So you've heard about the invasion of Ukraine. Um, before I go any further, uh, I wholly condemn the invasion of Ukraine by the Russian state. That is totally unjustified, regardless of what they're saying. All war is unjustified. Even defensive war requires an aggressor, making the war unjustified at its core. So truthfully, all war is unjustified. I absolutely condemn everything the Russian state has done. This is going. This conflict is going to create untold numbers of refugees, dead and wounded. Um, conventional wars don't really work in a modern sense. Military and civilian are very much tied up, and it's, it's hard to avoid civ civilian casualties, even if you know, that was the goal. It's almost impossible in a modern setting where there aren't open field battles to avoid civilian casualties, to avoid civilian fatalities, to avoid harming, putting people in harm's way who don't deserve to be there, who are innocent, who have nothing to do with the conflict. Um, so absolutely condemn that in every way. So unfortunately, I kind of feel like I called this a bunch of weeks ago when I started talking about Bayesian games and how escalations between um, the US and Russia were going to lead to conflict. Now, true, there hasn't been a conflict directly between the United States and the Russian Federation. Thank God. Um, may we not have a World War III scenario breaking out. That would be great. But truthfully, we were on a path to war very early. Now, I want to take some time today to talk a little bit about 
the players in the game, the contexts, and some more of what's going on that I haven't heard a ton covered by mainstream and even some independent sources. So I wanted to take some time to go through these things. And by the way, nothing I say here is taking a side except for the side of there should not be war, right? Um, I'm a peacenik through and through. I don't think any war is justified, as I said earlier, but I, I, wanted, I do want to give some context and then you can use that context however you see fit, right? So let's start with Ukraine. Who is Ukraine? What is Ukraine? So obviously Ukraine is an Eastern European country. It would be celebrating about its 20 year birthday fairly soon. Um, as, for, as far as a modern independent state goes, Ukraine is a baby on the world stage. It has only really been around as an independent nation since 1992 when the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, before that, the, the land that we now know as Ukraine was the Ukraine SSR, which was a member state of the Soviet Union, wasn't an independent state. Before that, the Ukraine was a, par a portion of the Pale of Settlement region of the Russian Empire. Before that, into the 1700s, the land that we now call Ukraine uh, was part of the Poland-Lithuanian Empire. Um, and before that, there aren't really records of a holistic Ukrainian state. There have always been people there. There have been people living in that area for a very, very long time. Um, and they have uh, bonds that they can trace back all the way to the foundation of the Kievan Rus, which was a small microstate in Europe in the like pre-medieval times. I'm forgetting exactly the dates. I apologize. I think it's like 980-ish. Um, was founded then, and Kievan Rus became Ukraine adjacent for pretty much all of history. So people who call themselves Ukrainians, they trace their legacy and roots back to the Kievan Rus. Um, who were an offshoot of the Muscovian Rus, who ultimately became Russia. But again, this has no bearing on you know Ukraine today, other than to provide its history. But the independent nation of Ukraine that we all know today, um, and hopefully continue to know for much longer, is a... Uh, is a creation, as it were, of the collapse of the Soviet Union, okay? And look, regardless of what you think about the longevity of Ukraine as a country or what have you, one of the things that we believe strongly in the left, on the left, is self-determinism, right? The importance of people being able to choose their own destinies. So even if Ukraine was two months old as opposed to 20 years old, if that's who they wanted to be, let them be that, right? So all good there. Now, let's address some of what was going on in Ukraine before this started happening, right? So Ukraine wants to be a part of NATO. Ukraine has wanted to be a part of NATO for a while now. Um, but there has been conflict in Ukraine uh, as far as who, what side of the Russia v. NATO side of this that Ukraine has been on. Um, the current president, um, Vladimir Zelensky, was... Uh, came after Petrushenko, I think was the gentleman's name before him, who was pro-Russian and was thought to be uh, thought to have ties to the Kremlin when he was running Ukraine. And so there has been this kind of back and forth now between what side of this divide in Europe that the Ukrainian government has kind of been on. But recent polls show that the people now are very interested in joining NATO. Of course, NATO is problematic for a number of reasons, and I have addressed them on previous shows. But essentially, the long story short is um, it is a defense, it is a quote unquote defensive military alliance that has had their guns pointed at Russia slash the Soviet Union since the 40s. It's a relic of the Cold War. It doesn't really need to exist any longer. Its purpose is expired. The Soviet Union doesn't exist. So Honestly, my assessment is we should just break up NATO that way. It's not an issue at all. But, you know, I digress. But at the end of the day, regardless of what side of that divide that Ukraine found itself on three days ago when it got invaded by the Russian state, it doesn't matter because Ukraine is innocent in all this in the sense that Ukraine was not trying to go to war with Russia and Ukraine was not trying to, you know, trying to actively... Um, antagonize the Russian state. 
militarily. Okay, Ru Ukraine was just doing its own thing. And a lot of this is happening to Ukraine because of where it sits, and, and so on and so forth. So that's Ukraine. Let's move over to the NATO side here. So as I mentioned, NATO was founded in the aftermath of World War II. It was an amalgam of capitalist US aligned states who were frustrated at the power of the Soviet Union and wanted to create a situation where they could um, where they could defend themselves against the Soviet Union, which was a pretty mighty power at the time. And once the and, and as the Cold War went through, NATO acted together to do what they needed to do um, to, in their opinion, protect themselves from the encroachment of the Soviet state, right? And and look, it's not like the Soviets weren't antagonizing. So at the time during the Cold War, hunky dory, right? Everyone was kind of being an asshole. So they acted as as defensively as they felt they could at the time. However, since the fall of the Soviet Union, there have been interesting antagonisms from NATO that aren't really talked about. So I don't know if you remember, um, but I think it was in 2012, I think it was either right as Obama was coming in or right before Obama was coming in, um, or maybe it was during Obama's term. I'm not remembering the exact year, but we moved missile systems to Poland, and which was a weird move because it kind of, if you remove all the context about Russia antagonism with the West and vice versa, it seems kind of weird to just send military hardware to Poland and missile silos to Poland. And when we did that, Russia saw it as an antagonism. By the way, one of the reasons perhaps that this is happening now is because Putin has been involved with Russian politics pretty much since the collapse of the Soviet Union. So he's he watched this too, right? So I'm, I'm going to get to Russia and their motivations in a second, but I did just want to put that in. So um, in the early 2010s, we put new, we put uh, weapon systems into Poland. We reinforce militarily our allies close to um, Eastern Europe. And essentially, we took a situation where all guns were pointed to a particular direction, and we just added more guns to that. So we have not exactly been innocent either here in keeping, you know, in, in keeping the peace and from being a non-antagonistic player in the game of European politics, okay? So, and, and by the way, there have been, you know, accusations from NATO countries that Russia has uh, done these terrible things. Um, now, some of which we have confirmation for, right? So they did poison politicians. Um, the Kremlin has had people thrown out of buildings. A poisoned journalist did show, a poisoned ex-spy did show up in a British hospital, right? There, there are things that Russia actually has done, which are very bad. Um, but there have been accusations that Russia is, is meddling in the elections of its neighbors and, and things like that. By the way, things that the United States does all the time, but, you know, very much pointing the finger at Russia and saying, you're bad because you do these things. It's not whataboutism, it's just the truth. So we're looking at the United States, uh, we're looking at the NATO um, incentives here. Now let's move on to the United States as kind of separate from NATO and what our incentives are, right? So it's difficult to assess exactly what the United States is looking to do in here, but it's while it is true that lots of American bureaucrats were also and elected officials were also bureaucrats and elected officials during the Cold War. And many of them just see the world that way still, right? They see Russia as the big bad enemy and they see America as the shining city on a hill. And by the way, we saw this attitude reflected during the 2000, um, 2012, 2016, and 2020 elections where there were accusations of um, Russian disinformation or Russians hacking the voting machines and, and things like that, right? So the media and the politicians have played a big game in antagonizing Russia verbally, right? So if you take these together, right, just giving you context, okay? And another thing is um, America is looking, so we have a ton of, of resource reserves, right? And we are constantly trying to pawn those resources off to uh to other nations right sell them make profit and things like that and we see russia's providing of gas 
natural gas and oil to Europe as competition with us, right? Because we sell to Europe as well. And Russia, they can send their oil to Europe for cheaper because they just have a pipeline. Uh, they can just deliver it over land, right? Whereas we have to take our oil by sea. Okay, so there's some of the US's motivations and kind of what, how we've been playing this game for a while. Now let's move to Russia. So Russia has an interesting and long history with the West. I detailed it on another, uh, on a previous episode of the show, but more or less, there has been this constant conflict about how Russia uses and shares its resources with Europe and um, Europe holding back technology um, and development aid and trade and things to Russia. So it's been a constant antagonism for centuries. None of this is particularly new. Okay. So back in the day, it was wood and coal. Nowadays, it's gas um, and oil. So last time I checked, Russia provided about 40% of Europe's oil and gas, which is a significant amount. And Russia has used that in the past to get what it wants. So oftentimes there have been situations in Europe where Russia um, didn't like something that was happening in the European Union, or they didn't like something that was happening vis-a-vis -vis NATO. And they threatened and occasionally did turn off the, the spigot at Russia and said, hey, you know what? you." don't want to behave the way that we want you to behave, we're just going to stop providing you with oil and gas. Now, if you're a country that relies on Russia for oil and gas, and 40% of all of your oil product, by the way, that's an aggregate for Europe, I'm sure, at, you know, per country, it fluctuates. But let's just say 40, right, as an average. If you're Germany, and 40% of your oil and gas supp supply vanishes, and the demand stays the same, you all know how capitalism works, the price shoots through the moon. So, and of course, that causes problems at home because the German citizenry then get very upset that gas prices are a gazillion euros. <laughs> so Russia has used this to their advantage because they've felt that, you know, there's some injustice or what have you. Is it justified? Maybe, but the thing is, it was at least a non-militaristic way to decide, uh, you know, to, to, you know, have conflict and conflict resolution in Europe. Sorry, I was just kind of struggling for what the right word there was going to be. And one of the other things that, that Russia has done is that Russia has kind of played out these small kind of pokes in the red line of Europe, which is which has not been explicit, but is kind of like, hey, you know, we don't really do the whole conquering nations thing anymore. We kind of gave that up in the 1900s after colonialism. So Russia has kind of tested the, the limits of what the West will let them do with their wars in Chechnya, with their intervention um, in Northern Asia, in um, how they have dealt with former Soviet bloc countries. It's just kind of easier to do them that way. So, you know... So Russia has been kind of seeing where they can get away with doing aggressive acts. And for what I think is good reason, the West hasn't really responded too harshly. I mean, there's occasionally been sanctions and things, but, you know, it's, it has, there hasn't been a ton of pushback there. So Russia in some way feels emboldened to do these bad things because they're not really getting a ton of pressure back, right, from them. So... Let's look deeper into Russia's motivation. So actually, I want to take a moment and go back in Russian history. So one of the key drivers of Russian aggression, expansion, and imperialism over time since 900-whatever, when uh, Muscov Muscovian Rus was founded, has been the seeking of a warm water port. Russia has always been a land with plentiful resources, but the problem has always been finding a way to trade them that isn't over land, um, because oftentimes Russia has been surrounded by... Uh, um, aggressive neighbors, and they've wanted to trade and to build their economy up by trading with other people. And the issue has always been for Russia that while they have access to lots of bodies of water, until very recently, those bodies of water would freeze up for nine months out of the year. And if you can only use a port for one to three months out of the year, it's not really a useful port for you. And the revenue that you get from it isn't particularly helpful either, right? So you get to the point where Russia is looking constantly for a way 
to find at least one port that they can use every day of the year, or at least most days of the year, because this would allow them to create um, a, a lot of economic development and modernization and, and things of that nature, right? Now, once we moved into the world of air travel, things changed a little bit, right? You can you can trade goods in other ways, but, but some goods don't fly, right? Um, natural uh, resources, um, kind of basic materials, basic resources, they don't really fly particularly well, right? No one's flying lumber as a trade resource, right? They're heavy, they, they would weigh down planes, right? So you need ships and trucks to do it. So this kind of brings Russia to this point. Now with the oil and gas, they were able to create pipelines and, and the more pipelines they can create, the more gas they can pump out, the more trading they can do, the more development money they can have, right? So there was some alleviation of this issue with the pipelines. Now you've probably heard of Nord Stream 2, which has now been canceled, uh, the United States um, for, uh, you know, they claim because of the inca incursion into Ukraine, they're canceling the Nord Stream pipeline or putting pressure on Germany to cancel the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which would pump oil and gas directly from Russia to Germany. And by the way, it's a perfectly good reason to get rid of the pipeline, right? But as I mentioned before, the United States also has an interest there, right? So we're not being totally, um, you know, we're not being totally putting our cards on the table when we tell Germany to close the Nord Stream 2 pipeline because America also benefits from that, right? Because if they don't sell them the oil, who's going to sell them the oil? The U.S. and U.S. allies, right? So there is some gain there for the U.S. as well. So bringing it back to the present age, the thing that's kind of interesting about the Ukraine conflict is that it doesn't really map with Russia's traditional MO uh, for conflict and expansion because Ukraine doesn't really have any warm water ports either. And where they do were, are those separatist re regions in Crimea that Russia has kind of sort of already aligned themselves with. And by the way, the Ukraine wasn't going to go in and retake those independent regions. So Russia kind of had the access it needed. So this is kind of out of the traditional scope of what Russian expansionism looks like. So then the next question becomes, what is the motivation? Well, as I mentioned earlier, Vladimir Putin has been a part of the Russian state politics since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And he very much has ambitions to put a lot of that back together. He feels as if um, that there needs to, he feels as if that the, um, the areas that are now uh, post-Soviet territories were, were properly Russian and should be brought back under the Russian folds. That's a possible motivation. One of the other motivations that Russia's had throughout history because of its antagonistic relationship with the West is they want the Russian motherland to have a border, a barrier between them and, um, and the West. And in this case, before Ukraine was talking about joining NATO, Ukraine was actually a great buffer zone because it was going to be difficult for European nations to kind of wage a conflict at Russia with Ukraine in the way. Now, in some sense, invading Ukraine actually nullifies this. It's a little confusing because if you take over Ukraine, then Ukraine becomes Russia, and then there's no barrier between Russia and Europe. But this is the same thing that happened during the Russian Revolution, uh, not the Russian Revolution, sorry, during the Russian Imperial Period, where essentially um, those nations, that's those post-Soviet, what we now call post-Soviet nations, were the pale of settlement region of the Russian Empire and essentially existed as a buffer um, between the West and Russia. And by the way, continued to do so as part of the Soviet territories up through World War II. Um, and just kind of a, an interesting factoid of history there, that's where the Russian state had kind of put all the Jews to to be the buffer between, you know, hey, if they're going to invade, at least they kill the Jews first, right? So anyway, that's ancient history. It's not ancient history, but it's history, and I'm, I'm not considering it in my analysis here. So the, the motivations kind of seem to seemingly lead back to either one of two factors. One, Putin is a Soviet man. He believes very much in Russian hegemony and Russian imperialism and wants to see um, the empire, as it were, or the the the, the Soviet the socialist republics, although I'm sure he wouldn't go for a socialist model, um, restored as they were under the Soviet Union or the Russian Empire. So I think there's some of that that's involved, but also to create some either uh, some non-neutral territory that is an actual buffer between the Russian motherland, the Russian state, 
as it's understood on most modern maps, and the West, right? Who Putin, uh, rightly or wrongly, mostly rightly, sees as antagonistic to Russian interests, right? But is that a reason to invade a country? No, it's not, right? There, there are diplomatic ways to create these buffer zones. Um, and actually, you know, Volodymyr Zelensky had said that we're not actually, you know, we want to be part of NATO, but maybe that's a pipe dream, right? Maybe in this current political climate, it's not possible. And so we just don't become part of NATO. And so it was on the table for Zelensky to actually not be part of NATO. So you'd think that part of the reason that Russia would have had to invade had gone away. So I really do think this kind of comes back to the ramblings of a mad Putin here. Um, I also think that there there are some economic reasons for this. Uh, and I also think that there are um, buffer zone reasons for this. I think Putin sees having buffer nations there as an important part of the Russian secure uh, of Russian security against Europe, who Russia sees as its primary antagonizer. Um, and I also think Russia sees itself as fairly safe from economic retribution from the West because China, who is a close ally of Russia, has essentially, you know, um, played their hand as neutrally as possible, but are going to continue providing the Russian state with economic um, relief and goods and things. So where does that leave us? So essentially, we end up in a situation where what we have going on today is happening. It's hard to tell exactly why, it's hard to tell exactly where the battle lines are, but we are in a terrible situation now because there's a hot war going on. Like we're no longer trading um, pithy barbs and things. There's an actual hot war. People are dying, uh, explosions are going off. And so what do we do about that? So the, the Biden administration has started moving to put sanctions on Russia, has ended the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. As I mentioned, that's not entirely uh, for selfless reasons. But these sanctions have to be very careful because sanctions in general are, as I've discussed on the show in the past, are actually a very dangerous way to enact um, warfare and can, and can be in some situations as violent or more violent as war itself. Right? Like the sanctions we're putting the US is putting on Afghanistan are, are perhaps more violent than the war itself was. Um, but if you sanction um, the bank accounts of specific Russian oligarchs, you sanction the, the money that the military uses, you can put pressure on the Russian state that doesn't lead necessarily to a hot war. Now, look. Once this starts going on, and look, if if Putin starts to feel this, this can go one of two ways. Either Russia amps up its aggression and essentially uses the sanctions as a pretext for a more um, disastrous war front where there is a seizing of resources, there's a destroying of property, um, for the benefit of the Russian state because of the sanctions, or Putin reaches out and attacks other countries um, as a way of recouping some of the losses from the sanctions, or, which is the, the hawk approach, or Putin takes the dove approach and says, you know what, it's too much, it's too much on me personally, it's too much on the billionaires that support me, uh, we're going to back out and we're going to we're going to sue for peace. Right. So there's two ways it can go. Truthfully, I don't know which way it's going to go, um, but I think they're going to have to be much harsher sanctions. Now, asterisk, right. The, again, these sanctions need to be equally pinpointed as the last ones are, but they probably need to be much harsher before you convince the Russian state to stop moving. Now, there's one more thing I wanted to talk about, just kind of a, a last point to, to round off this conversation. One of the interesting points is just kind of being reported as if there's nothing fishy with it is that one, the speech that Putin gave that was released that Putin had given about recognizing um, Luhansk and Donetsk as independent countries apparently came after Duma approval. So for those of you who don't know, the Duma is the parliament of Russia. Um, and for those of you who really don't know, the Duma is a rubber stamp for Putin and has been for a very long time. Now, it wasn't always this way. Um, 
But the Duma, actually, even in Russian history, has not been a particularly great independent check uh, during the during the time of the monarchy. The Duma was pretty much a rubber stamp for what the monarchy wanted to do, and if they weren't a rubber stamp for what the monarchy wanted to do, the monarchy did what it wanted anyway, <laughs> because they were a monarchy. So it was difficult for the Duma to ask an independent check. Um, during the Soviet era, forget about it. The party really ran things. The Duma was definitely rubber stamped if they were involved at all. And in the modern sense, um, there was some hope, right, in 92 that the Duma was going to be an actual check. It was going to be on the power of the executive. It was going to essentially um, be like Congress is, you know, uh, making sure, uh, writing laws and passing laws and hopefully more effective than our Congress. But you get the idea, right, like any legislature would do. However, Putin used his um, gravitas to essentially um, manipulate his way to where he is and then use his political acumen to weasel out anyone, uh, to, to use the power of the state and his political acumen to force out any um, politician that wasn't in line with his will. So when Putin sent his, hey, I want to invade Ukraine to the Duma, the Duma essentially you know, they said, well, how high, right? I mean, you know, there, there was really never going to be any amount of challenge to Putin from the Duma in this particular case. So that you, you'll hear a lot of people reporting that the Duma signed off on this. I, I wouldn't give any weight to that. The Duma is, is essentially a rubber stamp for the, whatever the Russian executive wants to do. And it has been very much like that for centuries. So yes, yeah, so that's just the last piece of information I wanted to give. So hopefully, look, I don't have the answers. Um, you know, I, I, I hurt very badly for, for those people in Russia and Ukraine uh, who are suffering right now. Um, you know, I, I kind of saw this coming when, you know, we heard that Luhansk and Donetsk were evacuating civilians to Russia. You know, when you see something like that, you just think to yourself, you know, they know something that we don't know, right? And that something that we don't know was actually something we all kind of knew, which was, hey, war's coming. Uh, and it's going pretty fast. So... Yeah, it's just, it, it's really tragic all around. It's very upsetting, this whole situation. Um, I hope for peace. Uh, I hope that there are, you know, that there are economic uh, impositions made on the Russian leadership, not the Russian people. Um, and I hope that as few people die in this stupid, meaningless, egotistical conflict as possible. And I hope that as you continue to think about what your opinion on this war is and um, who the good guys and bad guys are, if, if you even care to use that language, and truly I don't, um, you consider the information that I provided you here that, that you're not necessarily hearing um, from a lot of other uh, outlets and, and resources talking about this. So hopefully I was able to provide some context for you um, as, as you uh, formulate your opinions on the war and, and as you to have, this, have th these discussions with people in your life. And um, uh, God bless Ukraine. Um, go, well, God bless the Ukrainian people. I mean, states are, states are, they are what they are. But God bless the Ukrainian peop people. Hopefully, um, they are in a position where they are safe. And um, yeah, it's, it's really rough. Uh, and I, I feel really bad for what's going on right now. I wish it wasn't. So we only have a few minutes left here. So I wanted to talk about Tropical Storm Eunice. So for those of you who live in the United States or haven't really been paying attention to kind of European weather patterns, Tropical Storm Eunice is what we would typically refer to as a hurricane. <clears throat> it came up from West Africa, as many hurricanes do. However, instead of kind of moving along uh, the south and heading towards the United States, the Caribbean, like they usually do. This one kind of swung up um, with newly warm currents and came up and hit England. Um, and that's shocking for a number of reasons, the largest of which is that hurricanes really don't hit England. Uh, England doesn't have hurricanes or tropical storms very rarely. Now, mind you, 
this is not the first time that a tropical storm has hit England. Um, there have certainly been freak ones in the past, but this is actually the second one fairly recently in the last few years. So what we're starting to see here is a trend of tropical storms that are able to ride out um, warmer currents and head north. So usually what happens with a hurricane, and the reason that hurricanes kind of move the direction they move is because as the, as the winds follow the ocean currents, it creates kind of this circular effect, right? So at the bottom near the equator, it's warmer and it comes up and it cools off and then the storm kind of dissipates as the water gets cold, right? Up near, new, up near the New England, uh, Northern Atlantic area. And then by that time, you know, maybe you get some rain and a little bit of wind, but you're not getting like a tropical storm, right? You're not getting like that cyclonic, um, that circular cyclone spiral type, um, projection on a map that that sh that is demonstrative of tropical storms right and the reason is supposed to be because the water is just not hot enough to support that kind of storm right because you need a certain level of evaporation and it creates a whole you know um creates a whole hydro cycle i don't know what the right word is um a whole water cycle up and down to the ocean that fuels the storm and keeps it moving but if the water is not warm enough, it can't do that. The storm breaks up and, and just becomes kind of rain clouds. And so typically what England gets instead of tropical storms is rain. And look, Britain gets a lot of rain. Um, but rain can kind of happen in any of these conditions, whereas tropical storms really need heat to keep the wind moving, to keep the whole thing going. So the reason I bring that up is because as the oceans are acidifying, as the oceans are warming, um, which is a, a key feature of anthropogenic climate change, human caused climate change is those storms are able to live farther away from where we're used to seeing them. Now, it's not like the waters down by Florida and the Caribbean are getting any cooler. They're not. So storms will continue to flow on that lateral uh, trajectory from Africa to the Caribbean. However, now they don't necessarily have to go that way, right? Because the winds will naturally want to take the storm in the path um, that the winds go, which is from Africa to, um, to North America, to Europe, and back down to Africa again. That's the cycle that the Atlantic uh, waters go in, north of the equator. South of the equator is the opposite. And this just has to do with the heat of the earth and, and a bunch of climatology that I, I don't really have a bunch of time to explain. But so essentially what's happening is because the waters on the, east, on the United States eastern seaboard are warming, and they're warming farther out to sea, storms can actually hitch a ride on those waters and actually make it up to Europe without, without the storm actually breaking up. And this is what happened with Tropical Storm Eunice. So, and Tropical Storm Eunice, uh, reports coming out of the UK show that actually there hasn't been a ton of damage to people. There's been a lot of damage to property. Um, thank goodness, right? We always want to make sure that people are safe. And it sounds like the only real damage has been to property. So that's truly a blessing. And I'm very happy that that's the case. However, England should be warned because these types of storms are going to become more and more frequent as we hit more and more anthrop anthropogenic climate change. As the earth continues to warm, we're going to be in this situation where the, the waters continue to warm and thus more and more storms will have that kind of shortcut back into the Atlantic loop and will, they will take these tropical storms up to Europe. And Europe will see more and more of these disastrous storms. Now they're coming into England, right? Because that's kind of where um, the currents, the ocean currents break as far as coming up and down. But it would not be surprising if we start to see tropical storms coming through Northern France, Denmark, Germany, um, you know, even as now, it, I doubt it would get as, as far east as Poland um, or, or even Hungary, but we can, as the world warms, we, can, we will start to see these storms bringing water to places that are not used to having them and bringing these terrible storms to places that are not use, used to having them and not prepared to have them, right? And, and in any situation that starts to get weather that it's not prepared for, you have an increased chance that people die because they just don't have the ability to deal with it, right? Um, I live in the Northern Hemisphere uh, and in the Northern part of the United States. And, and there's a joke that, you know, 
half an inch of snow will close everything in Atlanta, right? And it it's a joke because, you know, in up here we're we're used to snow, right? If if we know it's going to snow, all the roads get salted, a bunch of pre- precautions get taken. And then when the snow comes, it can be gotten rid of fairly easily and pushed aside and yada yada, it's not a big deal. But for areas that aren't used to it, it takes much less of that um of that weather event to cause problems and damage. And you know, the more extreme these get and the less able we are to respond to them, the more likely it is that people die. So we just have to be careful that as we enter the more dangerous portions of climate change, that we are prepared for the types of weather systems that we don't typically receive, because that is the best way for us to avoid um, losing people to these these weather formations. Of course, we should be fighting climate change. We should be making sure that in every way possible, we transition away from fossil fuels. We stop heating the planet and, and all that stuff is important too. But we're past the point of prevention for climate change, right? So we're in the point of mitigation and adaptation. And humans are very good at adapting for better or for worse, um, but we have to do it now because we are starting to see weather patterns existing in places where they shouldn't, doing damage in places where they shouldn't. And these these problems are going to continue to become worse. Uh, Storms are gonna become more extreme. They'll appear in places they're not meant to be. And same thing with droughts, right? We'll we'll start to see um, the climate changing um, in fundamental ways in the next couple decades. So it's important that we that we mitigate. It's important that we adapt. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I want to talk about this as a climate change story, and, and I hope that people smarter than me, people who are in more positions of power than me, and even just regular people, start thinking about these issues that we're experiencing as part of the general climate change, and and use that to push forward for the policies that we need to um, prevent, mitigate, and adapt. And we are back, and ta-da, look at that nice rise. Now, I highly recommend that you do yours for longer, probably another half hour, but that's okay. We're going to punch our dough down, give it a quick knead just to get it back to shape. Remember, it's well kneaded, so you don't really need to do too much here. Then we are going to weigh our bread, because as I mentioned, we're making this into two loaves instead of one. And we're just going to divide, and as you can see, I'm about to do it very poorly. And I'm going to need to try over and over and over and over again until I finally, come on, Ben, you got it. Come on. And I got it right. Very good. All right. So we've got our two. What we're going to do with each one is we're going to flatten them out as into a rough as rectangle as you can. We're then going to take each corner, stretch it out, and then pull it in. Stretch out, pull in, stretch out, pull in. And we're going to do this for all of our corners. And then we will have created four new corners. We're going to do that with those corners as well. So just each one, roll it out, and you'll get a nice little log shape when you roll it over. We're going to do that with both of these loaves. All right, so now put them into your 9 by 5 by 3 inch bread tins, two of them in this case, and we are going to cover these and set these to rise for an hour and a half to two hours, okay? As long as you need more than double in size so that they fill the loaf tins completely, okay? Once you do that, you are going to set your oven for 375 degrees Fahrenheit and cook for 40 minutes in the middle rack. And you will know they're done because they will be beautiful golden brown, but also they'll register a temperature of 205 degrees Fahrenheit, and they will sound hollow and knocked. All right, guys, that is it for this week. I will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching this video, guys. If you liked it, throw a like on it, share with your friends, and subscribe for more of our content. You can also find all of our videos and clips on YouTube.com. Just search Let Them Eat Bread and you'll find all of our content. All right, guys, see you next time. Bye for now.